Coolidge Auditorium in the historic Jefferson Building here at the Library of Congress. My name is Loris John Schissel, and uh, I'm a music specialist in the music division. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about Victor Herbert. Um, this is in conjunction with an exhibit uh, I worked on with uh, Martha Hopkins from the uh, uh, Interpretive Programs Department, and that's over in the foyer of the music division. So if you have a chance to get over there, and actually see some of these treasures that we have in our Victor Herbert collection and in other collections within the music division that have a lot of Victor Herbert type materials or materials from his, from his epic. And, uh, but, but uh, I thought rather than, and this is going to be a very informal uh, sort of chatty talk about a composer that I've known, not personally, but known through his music, for about 20 or 25 years now. And as the, I think as you listen to some of this music, you're going to re-familiarize yourself with uh, music that you've known for a long time, particularly as we're getting ready to go into the Christmas season. It just wouldn't be Christmas without March of the Toys or uh, Toyland. So I thought I'd start it out right by playing some music. Um, and this is from a new CD set of Herbert's Irish romantic operetta that he called Eileen. The original title was Hearts of Aaron. And this was probably the operetta that was closest to Herbert's heart, being a, a patriotic Irish-born composer. And uh, this recording isn't quite out yet. It probably, I think this week it's going to be released. Um, but all of the materials that were used in the uh, reconstruction of this were found and used from our Victor Herbert collection over in the music division. So I'm gonna do two cuts of this. And like all good things, an overture is meant to give you a little taste of everything that's supposed to follow. So we'll hear the overture to Eileen, and then the second cut will be probably my second favorite Herbert song ever written, and this is called Thine Alone. So here are two cuts from the brand new Eileen. His favorite song too, but... but uh, and, and a lot of these you'll find throughout a lot of the Herbert operettas, waltz songs. Are, are always the sort of great tune that's waited for there. And, and I think a lot of that comes, and I'll, I'll talk about that when I talk about Hurley's, Herbert's earlier career, but he was first cellist in the Edward Strauss Orchestra when he was a young man in Europe, Edward being the third youngest son of the Johann Strauss family that way. So he learned his waltzes from the master that way. Um, I thought I'd start with two, two brief quotes that sort of are the things that I like to promote to people when I'm trying to convey an impression of what, what it was like to know Victor Herbert. And I think so much of what I'm gonna kind of talk about today is, is not so much Herbert's music, because I think trying to describe music is trying to tell a, a person who's colorblind about the color blue. But I think that you can, you can get a sense of, of Herbert as the person, a sort of larger than life person um, who really made an impact on people across the board. And if you go up to Central Park in the vast expanse of that area, there's only one statue of a composer in all of Central Park, and that's Victor Herbert. And when that statue was unveiled, um, Mayor Jimmy Walker was the mayor at the time, and he had a wonderful quote about Herbert. He said, Herbert would have been a great man even without his music. And to that, I always couple a different quote made much earlier in Pittsburgh when Herbert was the conductor of the Pittsburgh Symphony, when Andrew Carnegie was heard to extol, my idea of heaven is to be able to sit and listen to all the music of Victor Herbert I want. Whereupon Mr. Herbert was heard to rejoin in the background, Andrew Carnegie can go to hell. <laughs> and he really was this sort of larger than life Irishman. He was born Victor August Herbert in 1859 in Dublin. And his grandfather was Samuel Lover. And for a lot of people, if you're not Irish, you probably don't know who Samuel, I see someone nodding their head back. You know, do you know who? Samuel Lover is? We do. We, uh, he was a, an author. He wrote an, a very popular novel in the 19th century called Handy Andy. 
He wrote a lot of songs. He was a painter. And the Herbert household there, where, where young Victor grew up, was sort of a hotbed of Irish artistic types that would come and go, poets and painters and sculptors and composers. And uh, even uh, into Herbert's later life, he was still recording some of his grandfather's music as cello solos, the low-backed car being, being probably the most popular at the time. Uh, but he, he got his start early on. His father died when he was fairly young, and his mother remarried a German and moved to Germany. Uh, he was a physician, and uh, it was noted early on that Herbert had musical talent, so he was sent to school where his first instrument was the piccolo, uh, which he was not particularly good at. So they said, well, maybe you could try the cello. And from there on, the cello became Herbert's first sort of musical voice. And it was sort of his entree into the musical world that way. He studied with a, a well-known cellist at the time, Bernard Kosman, and uh, early on started getting a lot of engagements as a cello soloist. He played in the in various orchestras. He played for a, uh, a Russian prince in his private household orchestra's first cellist. And as I said, he, he became first cellist in the Edward Strauss Orchestra. And uh, it was about this time that he began composing music for the cello and uh, did so throughout his whole career. You know, the cello was always very much a part of Herbert. Even we have some recordings of him playing for the Victor phonograph recording later on where he wasn't quite as well practiced if you listen to him on our on our national jukebox site uh, but the cello always hung down at Luchow's down in New York and so when his buddy Fritz Chrysler and other string players would show up for a, a late night of, of heavy eating and heavy drinking the cello would come off the wall and then they play chamber music for the rest of the night and uh, that cello now is at the um, uh, Manhattan School of Music, and so the, the the scholarship cellist that comes in gets to play on the Herbert cello. But I thought I'd give an example, and this too comes off of one of these these new CDs of recordings uh, of music out of our Victor Herbert collection that we're we're revisiting and coming out with. All, I think at this point we have almost eight hours of Herbert music. But this is a piece arranged by Herbert that he scored for piano and cello that he used a lot on his uh, recitals. And here again, it's Herbert, the great Irish patriot, paying tribute to his homeland. And it's a little Irish folk song called The, Riddle, the Little Red Lark. So Herbert is, is establishing himself as, as sort of the go-to guy as a, as a premier cellist in Europe at the time. And he starts connecting with a lot of people. Here's someone who's very gregarious and, and, and very talented at the same time. And uh, he comes into contact with a lot of very famous musicians at this point. His teacher introduces him to Brahms, who asks that he be the principal cellist at a concert in celebration of Franz Liszt's 76th birthday party. So he's doing doing things like that. Later on, when he comes to America, he and Max Bendix do the American premiere of the Brahms double concerto here in, in the United States at that point. So, it's, so we see Herbert sort of leaning towards the classical concert uh, venue that way. Um, it's about this time as a young man in Stuttgart that he starts seeing a young woman who's a, sort of the premier Wagnerian soprano uh, of the era. And her name is Teresa Forrester, and they fall in love and get married. And as my colleague Ray White likes to say, Herbert, as she was uh, engaged to become the, the premier Wagnerian soprano with the Metropolitan Opera House here in New York under Walter Damrosch, it was Herbert, her husband, who sort of came over here to the United States, not so much on her coattails, but maybe her petticoats that way. But it worked out that, that Teresa Forrester got the job as, as the premier Wagner soprano at the Met, and Herbert got the job as a principal cellist in the, in the Met Orchestra in the pit there. And it was not without some 
embarrassment to Herbert that his wife was making an awful lot of money at the time and he was making 40 bucks a week as a pit orchestra musician at the time. So he's over here in the United States. His wife is having a successful career at the Metropolitan Opera and uh, Herbert the Ever Gregarious is already starting to make contacts with different musicians and you have to realize that New York for a musician in the 1890s was a much different place than it was now. We didn't really have what we would call a musician's union per se. And a lot of the musical organizations were, were organized by your ethnic background. So you would have, uh, you know, the, uh, the Irish musicians would gather at a certain place and that's where you would go to if you wanted Irish musicians. Well, Herbert wasn't to be found amongst those players. He was over with the German players. And so when Anton Seidel and Theodore Thomas, two very important American conductors at that time, are looking for good cello players, um, it's Mr. Herbert who's at the front of the line uh, shaking their hand and saying, I'm your man, hire me. So he's, he's uh, already establishing himself within the first year of coming here to the United States as, as again, the principal guy to go to when you want a, a virtuoso cello player. Um, he begins composing larger scale works. He was uh, doing work up in Massachusetts at various festivals. And one of his first works uh, was a large cantata called The Captive for full orchestra and large chorus and, and uh, soloists. It's a terrible piece of music. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, but it was his start, and, and if anything, uh, he certainly got his name in the papers at the time, particularly at these festivals, that he was, he was the, the one that all the girls were hanging around with, and everyone seemed to like to be in Victor Herbert's company. Uh, as we go through, we see as Herbert increases you know, his visibility and his accessibility and his money-making, his wife's career really diminishes at this point. Um, I think probably because she wanted it that way. Uh, certainly a different time and a different era, but, but she started singing less uh, as time went on, and she became very satisfied being Mr. Mrs. Victor Herbert at that point and started having children. Two that lived, uh, Ella Bartlett, who we'll hear more about later, and her son Clifford, who was sort of a ne'er-do-well, and more about his ne'er-do-wellness later. Um, it's at this point, probably in the 1890s, that Herbert has established himself in New York as a premier cellist. He's beginning to do more conducting, um, and his orchestral works are being performed by the Theodore Thomas Orchestra and by the Anton Seidel Orchestra, which in a sense are sort of, sort of early versions of the New York Philharmonic at the time. And since he's an exceptionally good conductor, Seidel and Thomas have him conduct his own concert works on orchestral programs. And this is also a period that, that uh, people don't quite think about when they think about this era, when they think about live music in a sense, is you, you realize that this is a time before air conditioning. And so people in the summer wanted to get the heck out of New York City where it was cool. And so places like Brighton Beach and Manhattan Beach uh, built built large hotels out there that had full large-scale orchestras that played throughout the whole summer. Bands played the Sousa Band, the Gilmore Band, these various orchestras. That was sort of the summer place to go. So if you were well off enough financially, you would move your family out to one of these hotels for the rest of the summer out at the beach and uh, take the waters and listen to a lot of nice music that way. And that's where Herbert established himself more and more as a soloist, as a composer, and as a conductor. And uh, it was during that time in 1892 that, as I mentioned, Patrick Gilmore, who this is pre-John Philip Sousa, was really probably America's most well-known and successful entertainer. He did it with a concert band. Uh, but Patrick Gilmore died in 1892, and Sousa sort of fell into uh, the reign of being the premier bandmaster at that time. Now, the musicians of the Gilmore Band didn't want to see the whole thing go to pot, so they kept the band organized. They had an interim conductor who didn't work out well, and someone got the idea of hiring Victor Herbert to be the bandmaster of the Gilmore 22nd Regiment New York National Guard Band. And uh, his friends warned him, don't do this, Victor. You're lowering yourself going out on the road with a concert band. They said, what on earth would possess you to become a bandmaster? And 
very frankly, he told them, it's the money. And uh, he became very successful as a bandmaster and remained a bandmaster all the way through the 1890s, almost into 1900 about at that point. And I always think of this imaginary meeting of John Philip Sousa and Victor Herbert Sousa uh, the 1890s was was also not only America's most well-known bandmaster and composer, but he was also at that time probably our most popular theater composer. And by 1897, Sousa had three operas running on Broadway simultaneously, The Bride-Elect, The Charlatan, and El Capitan. And Herbert was already establishing himself as a composer of operettas. And I always imagine this, this late-night meeting of Herbert and Sousa over several drinks where they where Herbert finally says, you know, Sousa, why don't you let me take care of the operetta stuff and I'll give up the bandmaster stuff and you can take care of that end and I'll take care of my end. Uh, but he he began in 1894 composing operettas, Prince Ananias being his first uh, produced opera at that time uh, and continued to write for the American musical stage Right up to his death, he was working on the Ziegfeld Follies of 1924 when he dropped dead of a heart attack in 1924. Um, and in that time, composed some of the most popular and most beloved operas or light operas um, that we've ever known. Um, and here, here's where I'll jump off a little bit because it's a question I always get from people. They say, what, what's the difference? Between, what is an operetta? Why is that different than an opera? What, what is it about? A show with music that that makes it an operetta and it can be a little different for each show that you look at and they certainly come up with all sorts of goofy names for it Eileen they call it a, a romantic operetta uh, some of them are called comic operas but but primarily an operetta which is sort of the precursor to what we call our American musical is is a play a light play generally an, enter, an entertainment uh, that's written and to which you add songs through it. And so there were certain uh, authors of, of light opera that, that run through this whole period, probably from about the 18, late 1880s up to about World War I. And that's really where the operetta starts to die out. But that's also where our young composers like Irving Berlin and George Gershwin and Sigmund Romberg and, and various composers like that start to take what Herbert and Sousa and these other fellows um, had sort of established and really gave it an, an American feel um, and took it up a couple of notch, notches both musically and story-wise. I mean the biggest criticism of, of Herbert's and most operettas of that period are the books are pretty flimsy and that's not that's not to say that they don't work. I think the, one of the, 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 the big mistakes you can make when, when looking at these shows is to say, well, the music is okay, but this book stinks. Uh, the music and the books tend to run simultaneously in the sense that, uh, that it's, it's not meant for highbrow audiences. This was, this was stuff that you could take your family to. This was, this was entertainment. And so composers like Herbert, even with his, his great classical background, had this tremendous ability to write these tunes that were very memorable. And I doubt that anyone here of a certain age didn't or doesn't have a grandmother or a great-grandmother or something that didn't have lots of Victor Herbert's music in their piano bench. Uh, this was music that was, was very much a part of everyone's everyday life. And it still is, like I said in the introduction, it can't be Christmas without the March of the Toys or, or Toyland or some of those iconic tunes. Um, at this point, you know, talking about Herbert the Operetta Composer, and we've, we've heard a little bit of that, I wanted to play just a, a snippet of a piece of music that he wrote, and it's like with so much of his music, his, his great skill was as an orchestrator, uh, but he wrote this fabulous music that's very much in the style of Franz Liszt and Richard Strauss, and that's really kind of his musical pedigree that way. This is a piece, it was pub published posthumously, and it was, it was originally written for full orchestra, but this is a piano version of it, and it's a tune called Devotion, and it kind of, I think it gives you a sense of Herbert's compositional skill outside of the theater that way. So this is devotion, flavor of a 
almost this kind of Scott Joplin type piece. Certainly a lot of his music, and he wrote large scale concert works, probably his most well known work today if you go to a concert hall is still his second piano or second cello concerto, um, which several cellists have championed throughout the years, Lynn Harrell being one, and Yo Yo Ma plays it an awful lot. And it's 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 really as far as his concert music, one of his real standard pieces that way. Um, but he also wrote an Irish Rhapsody, which when it was written at the time was one of his most popular concert works that way. Um, and a large scale suite called Columbus, uh, sort of in celebration of America's somewhat tardy celebration of, of uh, Christopher Columbus discovering America, although we celebrated in 1893 then in Chicago at the great Chicago World's Fair. Um, and these pieces sometimes get performed. I think when you listen to a lot of his his more large-scale concert works, you really do get the sense that Herbert was probably more comfortable in smaller forms, um, whether that be sort of two steps, waltzes, songs, uh, that way. And that that's really where he excelled that way. And so much of that music, like that devotion piece, was something that your grandmother would play at home on her piano. And that's where Herbert became a millionaire, was through the sale of piano sheet music of his songs, uh, that way, and he lived in an era where he went from the eighteen the eighteen nineties, where the only live the only music you had was the music that you made, all the way up through post World War One time, where you're getting into the phonograph recording at that point, and almost we're we're getting into the point where where we're going to have radio and different methods of transmitting music that way. But Herbert, at least initially, did it the old fashioned way. He did it in person, and he did that. Um, not only as a cello soloist, but but by the late 1890s, he established his own orchestra, which he called the Victor Herbert Orchestra. And that orchestra stayed in existence right up until the time of his death. Um, it was made up of a lot of musicians from the Pittsburgh Symphony. Uh, because at the turn of the century, Herbert was selected to be the first music director of the brand new Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, which Andrew Carnegie had allowed to do with uh, starting that orchestra. And it was not a pleasant time for Herbert because the folks up at Pittsburgh had a very different idea about what sort of orchestra they wanted up there. And Herbert, like all things Herbert, had his own ideas and didn't really give a damn what the people at the Pittsburgh Symphony wanted as far as their orchestra was concerned. Uh, but the musicians loved him, mainly because he got them an awful lot of work. Being a popular composer at the time, it was very easy for him to say, hire the Pittsburgh Symphony under the name Victor Herbert Orchestra and we'll come play for the rest of the summer at your resort or we'll do recordings for the Victor Recording Company or that. And here, here's where you get the sense, and Ed Waters, our former chief here at the music division, wrote sort of the definitive biography of Herbert, uh, but interviewed several players who were in the Pittsburgh Symphony at the time and uh, Herbert in rehearsal could be just as explosive as he could when referring to Mr. Carnegie going to hell. But if the rehearsal was going terribly, Victor Herbert could be just simply unbearable in rehearsal. But if the concert went really well, Victor Herbert would take the entire orchestra out for dinner and drinks. And uh, as, as one of the Herbert's arrangers said when he heard that quote, he said, that shows the generosity of Victor Herbert because musicians are a thirsty lot. Uh, but he, he spent almost five years there at the Pittsburgh Symphony, did a lot to establish the orchestra within the community, and he really was one of those terrific Irish gladhanders that everyone in the city knew him and everyone came to hear the orchestra. And uh, there's a wonderful photograph within the Victor Herbert, two photographs within the Victor Herbert collection over in our music division. And uh, one of the things that he did was he liked to bring in famous guest artists. And since he had this sort of musical pedigree as a musical uh, genius of the cellist from his European days, when he asked Richard Strauss if he'd come over and guest conduct the Pittsburgh Symphony, Strauss, I'm sure, jumped on the idea, mainly because he knew Herbert would have a well-prepared orchestra for him, and knowing Herbert from his European days all the way up through that time, knew that he'd be fed well and given lots to drink at that point, too. And so there's a wonderful photograph of Strauss as the guest conductor of the Pittsburgh Symphony, and in the one photograph, it's Herbert at the front of the orchestra, 
excuse me, let me start the story differently. The, the, they decided to have a photograph taken of Richard Strauss in front of the orchestra. And just before the camera was snapped, one of the musicians in the orchestra said, wait, we have to wait. Joe just stepped out to the bathroom. Well, Joe being one of the double bass players in the back row there. And Herbert said, never mind. So Herbert went back and you see this wonderful picture of the Pittsburgh Symphony with Richard Strauss on the podium and Victor Herbert back holding a double bass in the bass section there. Well, not to be outdone, Strauss said, well, let's switch places. So we have another picture of Herbert at the front of the, the, the Pittsburgh Symphony and Richard Strauss, the great German composer, sitting in the back row there playing the double bass in the Pittsburgh Symphony. Uh, throughout this time, talking again from the 1890s up, we're, we're in the early part of the 20th century now. Herbert has established himself as the go-to guy for the musical. If you want a successful musical and you're a producer, you go to Herbert. You find a book that Herbert likes or a, an author that, that works well with Herbert. And there's, there's a wonderful photograph of him in the collection. Given his great capacity for work, oftentimes he would work on three operas at the same time. And so in his studio in New York there at his house, he'd have a sofa over here that had his French-themed operetta that he was working on. And over here on a different chair would be another operetta, maybe on an American theme that he would be working on. And then his, his uh, operetta with a German theme on a sofa or a chair over here. And the way he worked it out was he had various liquors from, from the countries that he was working on. So he had his French wine for his French thing. And, and, uh, that's how, that's how he would run through that way, and he could. His musical assistants were amazed that he could work on one show for a while until he got sort of tired of it, take a drink, and go over and work on a completely different show, different book, at the same time, we're running simultaneously that way. Um, by the turn of the century, he was to to begin work on probably his his most famous opera which is Babes in Toyland. And most of us know it, unfortunately, probably by the Laurel and Hardy version that you see uh, lots of times at Christmas. And there's, there's very little to do with, with the original Babes in Toyland that they came up with with Laurel and Hardy, although a lot of the music is the same in there. But this, this operetta, operetta was co composed at an interesting time and sort of fits in tandem with, with other works that were being written at the time, probably one that you're all familiar with in its later trappings called The Wizard of Oz. Uh, it actually was by Frank Baum, uh, written at the turn of the century and was made into a musical and it took America by storm. Everyone went Wizard of Oz crazy. And so Herbert thought, let's, let's do something with this idea, this sort of fantastic world of of uh, wizards and and uh, tornadoes and such, and they came. He and Glenn McDonough came up with a with a, a libretto and story for this book. And unfortunately, most of us know it in its sort of watered down version. But it's really a very scary opera. It starts out with kids that are washed into this sort of scary uh, fantasy land that has giant spiders that come after them and, and all of that. Um, but it's one we hope uh, that will be part of the sort of renaissance of re-recording some of these musicals. But it, it, it really is a, a very much a grand opera in an operetta setting that way. And most of us know the great tunes from that. The March of the Toys is from there, Toyland. Uh, probably a generation ago, people would know other songs from it like I Can't Do the Sum and some of those songs that, that were very much a part of, of uh, Christmas and very much a part of our American musical vernacular. Um, and, and throughout that time, Herbert is, is working with different authors. I think probably, and Herbert would probably agree that probably his most successful collaborations were the ones he did with Harry, or Henry Blossom was his name. Um, they're certainly they're the best books of all of them. Although some of his later shows were done, oddly enough, with a woman author and lyricist. Rita Young was her name, who unfortunately died young of cancer not long after Herbert passed away. But she may have been one of those, those people that was, was a real champion or a real uh, instigator of the American musical had she lived probably post 
showboat or something. Uh, but uh, but if you if you go through these shows, um, you see what what ties them all together. The the two really great gifts that Herbert had was this amazing ability for memorable melody and also his amazing ability as an orchestrator. I think we're always, it's unfortunate that on recitals when you do actually get to hear a, a Herbert song from an operetta, it's often with piano accompaniment, not that there's anything wrong with that, but you really don't get the full treatment when you don't hear the orchestra. And just like when you heard on the, on the Thine Alone that we played, he was a master orchestrator, really of the Richard Strauss school. The interesting thing about Eileen is that he decided to dispense, if you listen closely to the recording, he decided to dispense with the bassoon completely in the pit orchestra, which is unusual. It's going to be your bass instrument for your woodwind family there, and substitute the bass clarinet. Uh, are you a bass clarinet player? Oh, all right, yeah. Well, you hear it throughout there, and it really changes. It really warms up the, warms up the sound that way. In my, uh, I do a lot of orchestral concerts. I conduct a lot of orchestral concerts, and probably over the past 150 or 200 concerts, I always sneak in a couple of Herbert's works, either as encores or something. Sometimes they don't fit the program. I, just last year, I did an all Gershwin program with the Cleveland Orchestra and snuck in a Herbert piece, but just told the audience that it was okay because Herbert and Gershwin were good friends. Uh, but the, the, the fun thing, the, the gratifying thing about being able to perform his music is that at intermission you have people come up and say, I just love that Victor Herbert number you did, Pan Americana or, or some piece like that. And at the same time, after the first rehearsal or the intermission, at the first rehearsal you have musicians of the Cleveland Orchestra coming up and saying, Oh, what a joy it is to play that music of Victor Herbert because it's so skillfully arranged. And particularly if you're a cello player in an orchestra, if you want to make friends with a cello section, you just put a pass out one Victor Herbert piece and they just go, ah, like that. So, um, see, I've gotten us up through the, the early parts of the, of the 20th century with Herbert as the operetta composer. <clears throat> Another hat that Herbert had, and it's sort of the three themes that I use in the exhibit over in, in the music division, is he sort of had many musical worlds. And so you have Herbert as the cellist, you know, the concert classical trained musician as a cellist that way. You have him as sort of the Broadway, the quintessential Broadway composer of his time. The other thing was that he was an activist. Uh, certainly anyone who's born in Dublin, Ireland, uh, and the grandson of Samuel Lover, is going to be very passionate about all things Irish. So it's not surprising that he didn't have much to do with the English and that his operettas were not produced uh, very much, if at all, in England at that time because he, quite frankly, didn't like the English. Uh, but he spent a good deal of his career promoting Irish music and the Loyal Sons of Hibernius Chorus up in New York City was started by Herbert and he was the first president of that group and arranged a lot of Irish music for men's chorus up there. He also arranged a lot of music to be played on his orchestral concerts that was of Irish uh, origin that way. The, um, I played that The Little Red Lark piece, the cello solo, that also has its, its, it's also orchestrated for string orchestra that way. Um, so he was very much involved in that. And certainly if you would ask him towards the end of his life what piece he was probably most proud of, it would be Eileen. That was really the culmination of, of all of his work. Um, it, it, I can't talk about his music for theater without at least mentioning Natoma, which is his grand opera. Uh, it was commissioned by the Metropolitan Opera, and uh, it's one of those unfortunate pieces. It wasn't the first American opera performed at the Met. It was, in fact, the second. Um, and Herbert probably wasn't smart in his selection of a book for that opera. And uh, he selected Joseph Redding. The, the story is about an Indian, young Indian girl and conquistadors and California, you know, sort of smacking of the girl of the Golden West by Mr. Mr. Puccini, uh, but the book wasn't particularly strong, and uh, and you get get the sense in Herbert's writings and his discussions with other musicians that he was really 
really deeply hurt by the poor reception of this show. Uh, probably as much so that, that he didn't go back and look at the piece again to see if it couldn't be fixed because the real problem which they saw right away at the first performance was in the in the between the second and third act that the the story really fell apart at that point and the music didn't support a bad story at that point and it's unfortunate because just weeks before he died in 1924 he finally was over the pain of of the poor success of this show that he said you know as i look at that second and third act it does sort of stink i'm going to go back and work on that uh, but he didn't live, unfortunately, to do that. And maybe with some fixing and with some tweaking, it may have become a better piece that way. He also composed a, a shorter opera called Madeleine, um, which was not received well at the time, but I think it's a piece that deserves a second look. And here you have Herbert as the great tune writer. You know, you can leave a Herbert operetta whistling songs that you remember right away after first hearing. And he really set about, when he wrote Madeleine, to write a show that wasn't particularly tuneful. He was really writing music that supported the, the action. And it's almost an impressionistic type opera in that sense, very much out of the kind of Debussy school that way. And it's one that Dr. Billington, when, he was, when I was showing him the, the exhibit we have over in the foyer there, um, him, him being a, a devotee and enthusiast for all things opera, said, well, I should go to the Met on one of these things. Should I, should I talk to them about Natoma? And I said, no, under no circumstances should you talk to the Met about Natoma. But if you want to show them an opera, show them Madeleine, which actually I hope will be part of this whole sort of resurgence of re-looking re at Herbert's music that way. Um, but we have, we have now Herbert with the unbelievable success of Babes in Toyland. But we also start to see by the end of the 1912, 13 sort of period there, American musical tastes are starting to shift and we have things like jazz coming in. And we can't use our modern idea of jazz as a sort of improvisational type thing where you have uh, a big band or something. Jazz at that time for a lot of players was to take a classical piece and syncopate it, or they'd say jazz it. And a lot of composers, Herbert being one of them, was not real hip on the idea of jazz. But as American tastes sort of change, you have young composers like Jerome Kern coming in and Irving Berlin that are really putting an American accent on their music. And it's at this point we start to see Herbert, Herbert's popularity and need to be on the, on the American musical stage are sort of starting to wane. Uh, but Herbert always willing to sort of reinvent himself, starts co-composing co a lot of shows with these composers. He wrote shows with Irving Berlin, worked with Jerome Kern on these shows. And by the end of the, the 19-teens, after the First World War, he's almost writing exclusively for the Ziegfeld Follies. And his, his work on those shows oftentimes were the dance sequences. And so, so here's where Herbert is allowed to continue being the sort of classically trained composer, but writing, uh, writing dance numbers for, these, for the Ziegfeld Follies. One of them, my favorite, and I'd love to hear it, but the music apparently is lost for it. But if this was the big era of the, the Ballet Roost and uh, Diaghilev and all that. So as a spoof in one of the Ziegfeld Follies, he wrote a ballet loose. And, uh, and oddly enough, on his desk uh, after he died, he was working on the Ziegfeld Follies of 1924, and he was writing a number for the Tiller Girls. The Tiller Girls were British dancers that came over at... Uh, in the early 1920s, and they had uh, sort of instigated or were promoting a new sort of dance routine that they had invented, and that was to take America by storm. They were line dancer that did high kicks. So we owe the Rockettes to the Tiller sisters, but he was working on a number for the Tiller sisters when he died. Um, speaking about Herbert as the activist, I've talked about his Irish passions. The other thing, that Herbert is probably most known for by a lot of people uh, is he was the founder of ASCAP, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. And last, this past year when we had the Gershwin Prize here, uh, one of my duties was to sort of take care of Dionne Warwick, uh, 
and her and I are both smokers, so we would, and you can't tell the police this, but we would spend time out here in the courtyard smoking between rehearsals and uh, chatting, and she said, well, what are you working on at this point? And I said, well, I'm doing a little exhibit of Victor Herbert over in our music division foyer over there, and she said, oh, Victor Herbert, you know, he invented ASCAP. And I thought, all is not lost if Dion Warwick knows who, who Victor Herbert is. Um, but, but the whole ASCAP concept came out of, out of Herbert's great passion for taking care of other people. And they were at a restaurant called Stanley's. Uh, and you have to understand, you know, in the 1900s, uh, restaurants had their own live orchestras. That's, that was a chief form of entertainment you had in a restaurant. And they were playing music. The one piece that they were playing was a march by John Phillips Sousa called From Maine to Oregon. And Herbert was there with some of his colleagues. And they're listening and, and talking and, and eating. And it really dawned on Herbert at that point, you know, here is this restaurant. And they're playing my friend Mr. Sousa's music. And they draw people into this restaurant to eat their food by playing our music, and yet we don't get anything from this. This is the same period where the phonograph companies are fighting the composers, saying, well, we're not going to pay you anything to record your music. We're doing you a great service. We're promoting your music. You should be thankful that we do, do this for you. Well, as, as uh, Mr. Herbert said, kind words butter no parsnips. And so he, he at that point, with, with some of his colleagues there, particularly Irving Berlin and John Philip Sousa decide they're going to they're going to sue Stanley's restaurant. And so they do. And the court case ends up all all the way up to the Supreme Court here in Washington. And it was decided that yes, composers should be paid for the use of their music in establishments like restaurants and in theaters and nickel and slot places and phonograph company recordings uh, of their music. And it was Oliver Wendell Holmes who, who wrote the judgment on this. And it's, it's one of the more unusual judgments that Holmes ever wrote. But he said, we certainly have to agree that composers should be paid for their music in restaurants. If we didn't have music in restaurants, what would we do when we're with boring company? <laughs> so with that said, you know, they won the case but sort of the fruits of victory were ashes in their mouth. What are you, how are you going to go about collecting money and giving it to composers whose music is performed in restaurants or you know, used in that way? And so Herbert and his friends decided to organize ASCAP, which was a way for restaurants, for recording companies and such to license music by their composers. So you as a restaurant would license through ASCAP saying, we're gonna use ASCAP composers music in our restaurant. And the restaurant would pay a little fee, maybe $50 a month or something like that. That would go to ASCAP. ASCAP would keep track of their composers, what pieces were played at these restaurants. And at the end of the month or at the end of six months, you get a little check in the mail from ASCAP for its use. Each time that the situation changed, since there was no precedent for these things, a the photo, phonograph company, um, player piano rolls, all those things, each of those cases had to be, basically ASCAP would have to sue to get a ruling on these things. So, so Irving Berlin and John Philip Sousa and Victor Herbert spent a lot of time here in Washington talking to Congress about revising the copyright laws so that protect, composers would be protected. But each time, a lawsuit would be, have to be filed, and then that would go to the Supreme Court. And each time, they, they've sided on the side of the composers, the creative artists that way. And that's an organization now that its, its members rank into the literally hundreds of thousands of composers, but also the people who write lyrics for songs um, and publishers of songs. And it, it's something uh, we're excited about because the ASCAP archive is here in the Library of Congress and ASCAP celebrates its 100th birthday in 2014. 14 will be the 100th anniversary. So, so stay tuned for a lot of exhibits and a lot of concerts and such celebrating that way. Um, Herbert, one of his last things that he was involved with before his death in 1924 was a very important concert by the Paul Whiteman Orchestra at Aeolian Hall in New York. And uh, it was where Mr. Whiteman was going to present music, jazz music, for the 
for the uh, uh, classical music loving elite of New York. And on that program were various pieces, uh, uh, a new piece by a relatively unknown composer, a rhapsody in fact for piano and for orchestra, a rhapsody in blue composed by George Gershwin. But the papers were all extolling that this concert was, was going to be a big deal because Victor Herbert himself had written a piece, a suite of serenades for this concert. And uh, we don't quite know the whole background on it, or at least uh, how this came about, but even uh, George's brother, Ira Gershwin, said that in the rehearsals of the Rhapsody in Blue, Victor Herbert had several suggestions to George on how he might tighten this up or that might add a few bars here to, to make the piece a little better that way. And uh, when that concert took place there in Aeolian Hall in 1924, I always like to say that American music was never the same after that. And it was the Rhapsody in Blue that literally changed the way we think about American music. And this is right at the zenith, right at the twilight of Herbert's career. And given his huge generosity and uh, help that he gave so many young composers, I think that having the papers so enthusiastic for for this young Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, probably the most happy person in the world about that concert was probably Victor Herbert, because here, here was the next generation of composer coming up, and nothing probably made him happier, knowing that uh, this was a young friend of his, a young composer. Um, by 1924, he's working on his Eggfeld Follies. He goes to the Lambs Club, of which he was a an active member, Lamb's Club being not unlike the sort of Friars Club or a theatrical club there in New York, has a nice lunch, doesn't feel real well, and decides I better go see the doctor because he was going to go over and meet with Mr. Zegfeld about, about the, the follies which were in rehearsal at that time. And uh, he went to his doctor, took a cab over there, went in, talked to the nurse, and she said, she said, the doctor will be with you in a couple of minutes. Why don't you go outside and get some fresh air or something? And so as Herbert stepped out on the landing of the doctor's office there and literally dropped dead of a heart attack in his early 60s. And uh, the reason why I say there's not a macabre fascination with Herbert's death, but it was reported in the papers there throughout New York and, and as all the papers in the United States talked about the great Victor Herbert passing away, all of the papers said that Victor Herbert was coming into the doctor's office when he had his heart attack. And it was Ed Waters, our former chief here at the music division, who talked to the secretary who had talked to Herbert that day. And the doctor, when, when they came out and saw a, a very dead Mr. Herbert out in front of the doctor's office there, swore his secretary to secrecy saying, it'll ruin my career if it hits the papers that Victor Herbert died leaving my office. <laughs> So they changed the story that way. Um, but, uh, but at that point, you know, all of New York was taken by shock that this great, great man, and a great many New Yorkers knew Victor Herbert as he walked everywhere, and people knew him and knew his music and liked him. And, and anyone who was with Victor Herbert for any amount of time out, out of doors would realize that before he got from point A to point B, any number of actors would come up to him and talk to him and say, well, I'm a little down on my luck. And Herbert would be the first one to put a $20 bill in their hand um, and take care of him that way. And I'm always reminded um, he had written some years earlier a piece for the New York Police Band. I wrote a march for them called The Finest. And it was the New York Police Band that, that uh, played at the head of the cortege for Herbert's funeral. And uh, Ed Waters interviewed the bandmaster at the time, and he said, he said, I came this close to playing the March of the Toys as we went down Fifth Avenue. He said, but I knew if I did that, I would have broken every heart in New York. And to close, I'd like to just read, this is, you may want to get, if you're really interested in Herbert, just in the past year, we've had all this wonderful Herbert stuff. And we, like all things in the music, we're always happy when, when our stuff is used and when people are enthusiastic about it. So we have, what, eight or nine hours of Victor Herbert's music now recorded, brand new recordings of that. This is a brand new biography of Victor Herbert by Neil Gould, 
and it's terrific. You can still find Ed Waters' biography of Herbert on eBay and Amazon and some of those places. Um, and for all, for Ed Waters' book, which is probably the most complete biography ever written about a composer, um, it, it can be a little on the dry side, but it's the place to go to where you need the facts on Herbert. And the thing I like about Neil Gould's biography is, well, I'll, I'll read it. It was part of my original text for my exhibit over in the, in the music division. As Neil Gould puts forth in the preface of his recently published biography, Herbert was more than a great stage composer. He was an ideal subject for a biographer. By turns litigious, bellicose, short-tempered, loving, faithful, collegial, patriotic, indulgent, generous, frustrated. In short, Victor Herbert was a great character. And, uh, and you know, I mentioned that quote that Mayor Walker had said about Herbert at the unveiling of his statue. I'm just going to read this little paragraph at the end of Neil's biography, which, which really sums up my sentiments about this great man. And then Mayor Walker surpassed himself and paid Herbert the greatest tribute of all, quote, Herbert would have been a great man even without his music, unquote. True enough, in every aspect of his life, his work, his generosity, his caring for the welfare and enhancement of others, his patriotism, his concerns for his family, he was great as only great souls can be. The music was a bonus through which he lives on, rich, varied, soulful, sweet, funny, and dare we say, in an age when scatology is accepted and this next is reviled, sentimental. In 1927, Ella pulled the cord, the shroud fell, and Herbert's bronzed face looked upon these transient scenes for the first time. And he's talking about the rededication of the monument in 2003. The few gathered in 2003 slowly dispersed, and then through the hanging mist we heard a melody, a street musician, a black man whose solo saxophone be playing has become an icon of the world of Central Park, began to play Herbert's Indian Summer. And we turned back, amazed, caught by the haunting phrases, and we looked up at Herbert's idealized face. Through the mists of that day and of time, he was smiling. That smile, that melody are endearing gifts to all of us, born of his rare artistry and even rarer humanity. Thank you very much. And I should be mindful that if you want to hear more of this fantastic music, we're going to celebrate the music of Victor Herbert right there in our historic Coolidge Auditorium on December 3rd, 2012 at 8 o'clock. Um, the cellist you heard on the recording, Jerry Grossman, is going to be performing. Uh, and we have an array. I'm not allowed, am I allowed to say that uh, Rebecca Luker is coming? <laughs> oh, good. I can legally say that Rebecca Luker and a, and a whole, Betty, tell them the names of the singers. I'm bad with singers. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Corliss Euchre, a uh, wonderful young mezzo at the Met, who also happens to be married to Jerry Grossman, Jerry Grossman. who will be the cellist, uh, and who is cellist in the Met Orchestra, um, will be there. Um, Ron Raines, uh, who has done a lot of American musical theater and um, operetta, and who's best known to everybody probably except me as having been the bad guy on Days of Our Lives oh, yeah. for yeah. Uh, I don't know how many decades. Um, uh, Bill Hicks. Um, Who's the pianist? Was he the, the devotion pianist? Okay. Yep. Um, is um, going to be at the piano and it's Bill and these singers and who did the complete songs of Victor Herbert on the New World recording mm -hmm. set of CDs. And Bill and Jerry Grossman um, 
did a new world recording just before that of uh, the Victor Herbert Cello Concerto, and they hope to continue doing both orchestral and piano cello pieces for a new world. So get your tickets for that. I, I think those are going to go fast when everyone hears who's going to be performing there. So if you have any questions, too, I'm, I'm more than glad to answer. Excuse me. I don't want to Oh, that's Herbert right there, and that's a, that's a great picture of him. Oh, yeah. One of his most successful, and also it's not his first, it's in fact, it was sort of in his landing period. Yeah, it was sort of his last big hit was Eileen. That was the one we, we played a little little clip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And musical tastes were changing at the time. I mean, Irving Berlin was writing, you know. Mm -hmm. So... And if there are no other questions, I'll send you out with my, my other favorite song from Eileen, which is the big finale for the chorus. And I love the title. Only Victor Herbert could come up with this. It's a great day for the Irish tonight. <laughs> <laughs>